All right. Greetings. I'm Brother Jay Spence here on a so-called Monday. I believe it's officially May the 3rd, 2021, Gregorically speaking. And uh, in the previous vid this past weekend on Shabbat, or on the true seven-day Sabbath, which is also your so-called Saturday afternoon, I began the uh, Torah portion reading. So we shall continue in that. I had to uh, meet up with a, a good friend of mine and ride with him out to a, a place called the Parkway uh, in Salem. You know, Salem County, even Salem City is uh, kind of that extension of, of Roanoke. I mean, technically it's not Roanoke, but it's almost like an extended uh, Roanoke County or, or Benton, you know, in, in, in my area here in Roanoke, Virginia. So actually, uh, if, you, if you make the right twist and turns, it's not that far of a drive from here. So it's kind of like Roanoke or an extension of Roanoke County outside of the city. But anyways, with all that being said, I got to set my conga drums right here. Because you can't see them on camera right now, but I have my congas. Loaded up in the back of uh, Matt's automobile, and we were able to successfully get out to uh, the parkway in plenty of time to set the congas on stage for sound check with my brethren, uh, Gabe Lewis, also known as uh, the ambassador for the ambassador music, fellow uh, reggae ambassador of the One Love Music, and he is also the former. Uh, lead vocalist in, uh, or should I say he is the lead vocalist in my former reggae band called The Sea <clears throat> from 15 years ago. And uh, we've done some Sea reunion shows in the past 10 years, but uh, in the past recent, I would say five or six years, um, my brother and Gabe has gone by the ambassador. Of course, he was known as the ambassador in The Sea but he, he has his own self-titled uh, The Ambassador Music because he moved out on the West Coast. <clears throat> Salika, he was out there in the West Coast in um, San Diego for six years with his wife and uh, kind of put his name out there, opened up for other great artists such as Stick Figure and Slightly Stupid and a lot of the uh, West Coast Cali reggae you know, over there. But I uh, came back over here to run it Virginia here in the East Coast. And I haven't played with them a lot in the past five or six years because of personal life situations. You know, he's raising a little girl now, and I've been going through personal trials and tribulations in the past four or five years. So with all that being said, it was a blessing to play with my brethren, uh, the ambassador and friends up on stage. They also got to rock with uh, Janiah uh, from the Atlians and from his present band, titled uh, Music Road Company, or Music Road Co. with his brethren, Jamuel. So, uh, and Melissa Me uh, Mesco. Melissa Mesco up on stage, sing singing harmony vocals or backup vocals for Gabe and a couple other brethren that I had never met before. So it was a blessing to do good on Shabbat, to do good on the Sabbath, as the Most High instructs us. As Jah teaches I and I through Christ, Yeshua, in the first advent as our Lord and Savior. So we say through his majesty, those of I and I fulfilled Beta Christians and spiritual Israelites, you know, both ethnic and, and spiritual Israelites of, of heart in Christ, through his majesty as the one true King of Kings in Jesus Christos Yeshua. You know, so we got to do job works. And the one love music is always a part of job works because my brethren, my fellow reggae ambassador, he calls himself the ambassador. Um, it's all about that one love. You know, he's all about that one love, as I am. And when it comes to John music, and a lot of his lyrics are positive. Spiritual-based lyrics. But anyway, let's get into the tour portion that we began this past weekend to finish up on last week's tour portion reading. It's already so-called Monday of this new week, rhetorically speaking. May, what is today? May the 3rd, 2021. It's actually the second day of this new week and this new cycle. So technically, we have to get caught up on last week's Torah portion, as well as the Haftarah, the Gospel Extension, and then eventually catch up with this week's Torah portion. But like I said, I've been in a, a transition period 
in this uh, resurrection season, the spring season. I've been in this transition. So it's not a bad thing. It's a good thing. Also dealt with some spiritual turbulence here and there. So let us give thanks. I had to get up and work this morning as usual. <clears throat> I had to work yesterday morning. I'm back on the usual grind of working six days a week and being so grateful and so thankful to have one day off on the seven-day Sabbath, on that true seven-day Shabbat, to keep holy and set apart as we all should regarding Hashem's commandments, regarding the main ten commandments, as well as, well as other mitzvah, as well as other mitzvah and commands we're supposed to know and keep in fulfillment of Yahshua the Messiah. Fulfillment, you know, as Rastafari, as fulfillment of his majesty, Karamawi Hale Selassiei, as the one true king of kings in Jesus Christos, or in Yahshua HaMashiach in the first advent, as our Lord and Savior, and as our advocate too, the omnipotent, omnipresent father of creation, that we call the most, the most high Yahweh, Jah, the father. So we say in the name of the father, in the name of the son. In the name of the Holy Spirit, let's, let's get our minds right for this study. Yeshua I, Messiah I, all right. So yeah, a blessed, wonderful, awesome performance this past weekend. You know, blessed vibes, we had a great show. I felt the energy up on stage. I let Josh Spirit, you know, the, that Irit, you know, work through I and I as I rock the conga drums, you know, playing the conga drums from that, that heartbeat, you know, and just adding that roots essence to uh, my brother's music. You know, Melissa Mesco was on stage singing backup vocals and harmonizing with my brethren. And you had uh, Brother Janiah on the bass. So we had a wonderful time. <clears throat> and I saw... Of course, I got to see a lot of uh, familiar friends and faces that I haven't seen in a while. So, you know, it was a blessed time in the latter hours of Shabbat before sundown. And shortly after sundown, we finished up that second set. So my brother asked me to, to play with him again on a regular basis. And I was so grateful to <clears throat> catch up with my other brethren, Brent Hoskins, the original drummer in the seed that my brother and Gabe. I got to, I got to borrow the uh, kabasa. It's a traditional kabasa from the seed, you know, so we play that original reggae rhythm. You see, you have a traditional seed woodblock. Actually, my brother and, you know, Brent's woodblock, but it's the one I used in all, the, all these different shows, all the classic seed shows, and I probably used it a couple times in the past five or six years for the ambassador. But anyway, <clears throat> back to the word. So let's let's pick up where we left off. All right. So verse uh, one of chapter 21 in uh, Vayikura or the book of Leviticus beginning in chapter 21. So go to your Bibles, grab your Tanakhs or even your Torahs because the first five books of the Bible is the Pentateuch is really the uh, the Torah, the living Torah you know, of Hashem. The first five books of, of, of Moses, the great prophet Moshe. So Leviticus chapter 21, verse 1. And Hashem, thus the name Yahweh or Jehovah, as we say in that, that sacred name, others pronounce Yahweh or you know, Yahovah. Some pronounce, you know, Yahuwah or Yahawa. Some pronounce the I am, uh, Ahaya. And we say it's all the above. Mm -hmm. It's all the above. The Tetragrammaton name. We say Hashem in the Hebrew. The name is Yahweh or Jehovah, the Most High Jah, as he is Ahaya. Yahuwah or Yahawah, it's all the above, as the one true Allah I am of creation. We say Allah as the you know subjective name in, in the in the Arabic, but it stems from the Hebrew, that Hebrew root, the same Afro-Semitic languages from the Hebrew roots of the Allah I am, from the Paleo-Hebrew, um, or the Elohim. 
know, Elohim is plural. When Eloah, you know, Allah, you know, the Avahayim, but that's a subjective name. His sacred name is yud Hey vav Hey or yud Hey wow Hey in the Hebrew, both the ancient and the Masoretic, modern-day Masoretic Hebrew. That was, we know, is revived through the Ethiopic, through the Royal Amharic tongue and the Ge'ez, that pure language of Giz or Ge'ez, and that original Afro-Semitic roots. So <clears throat> we say Hashem or the name. Most of your uh, biblical translations will say the Lord, capital L-O-R-D, the Lord Yahweh Jah, said to Moshe, or to the great prophet Moses, Speak to the priests, the sons of Aaron, the sons of Aaron, the high priest, his brother, the Kohen Gadol, and say to them, No one is to be defiled for the dead amongst his people. See, I read this last time in the previous vid, in the part one, I do apologize but because there was so much of a gap in me talking about this past weekend and having to cut it so short, let's go back to the beginning. So verse 1, we just read that. No one is to be defiled. Not one person is to, is to be defiled for the dead amongst his people. They don't go near the dead, a dead body. You know, you considered unclean if you physically touch a dead body or get too close to a dead body I don't care if you're working at the hospital or the funeral of course there's more grace by Hashem Yeshua in these renewed covenant times through Messiah through Christ if you happen to work at a hospital of course Hashem or Yahweh has mercy you know, the Most High Jah is merciful in situations like that even in old covenant times you know, John knows these things but on an average regular basis you know it said, no one is to be defiled for the dead amongst his people, <clears throat> except for his relatives who are nearest to him, for his mother and for his father and for his son and for his daughter and for his brother, the intermediate you know, earthly family. Verse three, and for his maiden sister who is near to him, who has had no husband, for her, he is defiled. In verse four, it says, a leader does not defile himself amongst his people to profane himself. No leader does defile himself. Verse 5. They do not make any bald place on their heads. They do not have um, the corners of their beard shaved. I'll read that again. And they do not shave the corner of their beard. They do not make a cutting in their flesh. Now this tradition of shaving a bald spot on your head it's kind of interesting because we see some of the early Anglican Christians not all of them but some of the so-called priests and monks other so-called saints would shave a, a, a spot in the top of their head and that's not really biblical someone even take it to the point where they, they say well you should not have your head covered you know, the other camps of uh, modern-day Israelites even more authentic what they call black Hebrew Israelites, all due respect. Not all of them, but many of these other camps teach that you should not have your head covered. You defile yourself or disgrace yourself. And that's a spiritual metaphor, even in the so-called New Testament, which is really one testament, fulfillment of this Torah, this great Torah of life. Better sheet are from Genesis to Revelation and so forth. Better sheet to Genesis to Revelation and so forth. You know, this is the, the Torah of life. It's one testament. So a leader does not defile himself amongst his people. When we think about a ball place on their heads, you know, it's not a literal shaving a ball spot on your hair, on top of your head, or uncovering the top of your head with a hat or a capa or you know, a tom, uh, you know, or a kufi or whatever whatever you might use as a turban, even a turban or any kind of head covering, a mitri or a turban, it's a spiritual metaphor. <clears throat> So-called New Testament, it's really one testament, through Messiah, through Christ, even more so through the King of Kings and Christ. Um, you know, the Boba Shanti Rastafari amongst the fulfilled Israelites and better Christian. As true Nazarene known as the Rastafari um, Bobo Shanti mansion, you know, have their dreads and their heads covered in turbans at all times. So there's different reasons 
you know, other mansions <clears throat> of Elect Rastafari, you know, where their Tams are uncover their, their, their head, even the dreadlock Rastas uncover their dreads, who some of them have taken upon the Nazarite vow. Some of them just grow out the locks for the symbol of the, the, that lion symbol, you know, the lion's mane. There's different reasons that different Rastas um, grow out their dreadlocks or a lot of the, the first Rastas that were you know, considered bald head Rastas, but they're still, still true like Rastafari. Take up on that new name. So any true Rasta man, any true Rasta, whether a brother or sister or Rastafari, must be a fulfilled Israelite of, of, of heart and spirit through Messiah, through Christ. Must be a true Christian spiritually. You don't have to title yourself. You don't have to title yourself Christian necessarily in that Sanskrit tongue. But we have to be. We have to be honest. Even his imperial majesty, Rastafari himself, Rastafari Makonan. Ali Selassie I himself. It's the king of kings. You know, in his humanity. Of course, we speak of his divinity first and foremost, as we should. But his humanity. Even as the Lion of Judah, he is a Orthodox Christian man. Being the returned son of man, or that true Christian man, to sit upon the throne of David. The throne of David in Judeo-Christian Ethiopia. That true monarchy of David that's been resurrected through that kingdom, right there in the heartland of Mother Africa and Ethiopia. So, anyways, to shave a bald spot in your head was kind of a tradition of the Mitzrites. Now we have like a lot of the going back to some of the um, I want to say Gentile Christians, but some of the European of the of the Gentile uh, early Christians that were genuine Christians. A lot of the first Anglican churches broke away from the Roman Catholic. Just like the Orthodox, just like the true original Ethiopian Orthodox Tawahedo Christian Church, that true Christian faith that took upon the Sanskrit name of Christian, and the Greek of Christos, in Christ, the Anointed, the Mashiach or the Messiah. But you know, the, the a lot of the early Anglican so-called Christian saints and monks, <clears throat> they may have done that for similar purposes as these other camps of. Uh, Israelites, these other types of Israelites that read parts of the so-called New Testament say one should not prophesy, you know, with their head covered. That means, you know, that connection, both that spiritual and metaphysical connection with man, woman, and child. The, the man is the husband. The man is the head. The most part, men and, man and woman are equal, as we should be, but man is more of the head. The man comes first. He's the husband. He's supposed to love and honor and respect his wife. And she's supposed to love and honor and respect him. So to let a woman be over top of your head or have your head uncovered, you know, is not righteous. It's not part of Hashem's kingdom order. It's not part of Jah's kingdom order according to Jah Torah, his great book of life, according to his commandments. A woman... She's called to be a sister or a righteous woman. You know, she's to have she is meant to have her head covered. Now, this is both spiritual and literal, depending on the situation. I mean, a, a woman does not always have to have her head literally covered. It's a good thing as far as you know, God consciousness, and you know, we see not just uh, Rastafari sister. Some are more free and have the times. Some have the head coverings amongst the Bobo Shanti order or mansion of Rastafari. Just like the Orthodox Christians, Ethiopian Orthodox Christian women who are also Falasha, Hebrews, and even amongst those who call themselves Muslims or Muslims. We know that we're all Muslims spiritually. As far as the definition of Muslim or Muslim is one who submits to the will of God, right? The true living Allah or Elohim. See, if you're a true Christian, you're anointed. If you're a true faithful Hebrew Israelite, you know, the Yehudi, Yahuda, who praises the Most High true Elohim. It's all connected. You know, one, one is a Jew or, Yehu, or as Paul says, one is a Yehudi or a faithful Jew inwardly, not according to flesh and blood. See, it's a whole different. So we have to digest these things properly in that true Christ mind. So, once again, 
this uh, shaving a bald spot on your head or shaving the corners of your beard was going back to ancient Mitzrite traditions. Not true original Egyptian traditions that are more parallel to Kemet, which is parallel to ancient Kush or Ethiopia, as far as the Moors and metaphysicians based off a, a, an original Yahweh or Jehovah-based faith, you know, a true Allah or Elohim-based faith before all these other idols crept in. That the influence of the Nephilim or idolatry of the influence of the jinn or the Nephilim that crept in to ancient Egypt. Before, you know, before that it was Kemet. So these names like Mitzrayim, as we say Hebraically, or Egypt means bondage. So there's a huge difference in the earlier dynasties of, of ancient Kemet than we know as the so-called Egyptian dynasties in the time of Moshe or, or the great prophet Moses and the Israelites that were oppressed and enslaved for so long in this time. <clears throat> but uh, Or shortly before this, this took place. Now in Leviticus, we're just receiving the, the mitzvah, the uh, Regeneration of the Torah in this time through the great prophet Moshe and to I and I to read and meditate in this great book of life. So anyway, and the same thing with cutting of flesh. These refer to idols, false gods. Not that it's necessarily a sin to literally shave a, a bald spot in your head, just some random part of your head just to be stupid. If you want to be stupid... Be stupid. It'll grow back. Not a big deal. If you want to shave. You have, you have, if you want to have a, a certain style or be a trendsetter and you think it looks cool to shave the corner of your beard, hey, then trim it up. Just don't do it in a certain format that honors a false god or idol. This is the content we're supposed to meditate on right now. This is the proper interpretation of these, of these scriptures. So, once again, they do not make any bald place on their heads. And they do not shave the corner of their beard. They do not make a cutting in their flesh. Don't mutilate yourself. Some of these uh, indigenous tribes, not all of them, but a few of them, referring to other deities, which are false gods, fallen angels and demons of Hasatan or Satan. That mutilating, that they're mutilating their flesh and cutting themselves in connection or in in uh, correlation with idolatry. So says, do not do any of these things. Do not make a cutting in their flesh. Verse 6, they are set apart to their Elohim. And do not profane the name of their Elohim. They bring the fire offerings of Hashem, or the name Yahweh, and the bread of their Elohim, and shall be set apart. It shall be holy. Kodesh, or Kadus, set apart. Verse 7, they do not take a woman who is a whore, or a defiled woman, they do not take a woman put away from her husband, for he is set apart to his Elohim. So, wow. Do not take a woman who is a whore, of course, or a defiled woman. Do not take a woman put away from her husband, for he is set apart to his God, to his Elohim. Verse 8. You shall set him apart, for he brings the bread of your Elohim. He is set apart to you, for I, Hashem, Setting you apart, am set apart. So we have to be holy as he is holy. Verse 9. And when the daughter of any priest profanes herself by whoring, she profanes her father, she is burned with fire. Literal, spiritual and literal fire of judgment. These are old covenant times. I agree with that, but the commandments are still commandments. The consequences are still consequences. Even more so in these renewed covenant times. Yes, we live in a better grace covenant in these renewed covenant times through Messiah, through Christ. It's the same principle. Um, the daughter of a high priest, <clears throat> not just a priest, but a high priest, the Kohen Gadol, is to be more set apart than any average sister or queen or empress amongst the family. Okay, and she profanes herself by whoring where she settles down with her husband-to-be. I mean, there's consequences for that. So, <clears throat> you know, that, that, that fire burns. Now today we're not under the law, meaning we're not in the land of Israel with the priesthood set up, uh, the old priesthood with the tabernacle or the temple. <clears throat> we have the ultimate priesthood or that fulfilled priesthood through Yah's grace or, or through Yah's grace in Yeshua, through Jesus Christ. 
or Jesus Christos, our Lord, as the Messiah and our Lord and Savior, and that first Advent and our advocate who intercedes for us. He is our advocate and atonement that covers us, as well as our advocate to Elohim, to Jah the Father. He is the ultimate finalized high priest. Therefore, in him, we are all called to be kings. We are all called to be kings and priests spiritually through Messiah. Did you know that? That's not blasphemy. That's right and exact. Did you know that? But he is the king of kings and the ultimate high priest, as well as our Lord and Savior. The king of kings, our advocate to the Father, the omnipotent, almighty one. You see, as above, so below, from within. So, <clears throat> once again, that's, that's serious business. Verse 10, and the high priest amongst his brothers, and on whose head the anointing oil was poured, and who was ordained to wear the garments, does not unbind his head, nor tear his garments. It says, does not unbind his head, does not take off the turban. So some of these others, you know, all due respect, you know, some of these other street preachers, you know, I've been considered myself to be a street preacher, but some of these other camps, I'm not going to call out names, but, you know, really go back and meditate in the Torah, and meditate in the scriptures before you go back out preaching that stuff. The one fouls himself just because he's wearing a hat or a turban. Come on now. And you shall set him apart, for he brings the bread of your Elohim. He is set apart to you, for I, Hashem, setting you apart. Once again, and when the daughter of any priest profanes herself by whoring, and not any, any daughter of any righteous man or any man in general should not be a whore. No male or female should get caught up in whoredom. It's one thing we have a lot of influences of the world. In, in the core of this whole wicked Babylon system, this world system, especially in this melting pot culture, yes. And the flesh is the flesh. We're all humans, yes. But, you know, it's one thing to like, you know, get out there sometimes and you meet different partners and you start dating people and you should try to try, to, you honestly should try to reserve yourself. But we're humans and we're, you know, even as adults, we, we have needs and we, we and sometimes we dabble in things that when the hands of uh, karma judgment come back, smack us in the face, come back to bite us. You know, you find your pockets empty, you go from one job to the next job. You didn't pay so many shekels of silver or, or dollar bills to that, that woman's father, you know, that woman's biological father. That's what the Torah says. You know, do not cut off from the kingdom for that. It says, you know, you wonder why you, you had, uh, you lost that job, lost money. I've been through my own karma judgment. I've been through my own karma judgment to be able to teach on this. So in all humility, I, I've been through it myself. Even striving my best to stand upright and walk this path, you know, walk this path of true faith. I've been through it in the past recent three years. Been with my, my lady, been with my queen, uh, Pam the past two and a half years now so and i love her very much the most high job put her into my path at the right place in the right time and vice versa but but uh me into her path as well but um uh, don't get caught up in whoredom try to reserve yourself it's better to really preserve yourself 100 percent if you can the screen just popped up again but yeah i mean just preserve yourself from whoredom Try to even save yourself, if you can, in all purity, for the right one. I know that's hard, but if you can, it's better to preserve yourself for the right one that you're meant to be with. You know, and that doesn't mean that you're cut off because you can't do it, or because you've had a couple, a few partners or ex-girlfriends or ex-boyfriends before. The one you you finally settled down with is your permanent, you know, wife or or husband to the ladies out there. So you get what I'm saying. <clears throat> you know, it's better to keep yourself pure. Verse ten, once again. The Kohen Gadol, the high priest amongst his brothers, on whose head the anointing oil was poured, and who is ordained to wear the garments, does not unbind his head nor tear his garments. Verse 11. Nor come near any dead body or defile himself for his father or his mother. So it was even more strict for the priest, especially the high priest in that time. It was Adon, the ones that took his place after that. Now it's through Christ, but even we are in Christ. And Christ, or Messiah, is in us. Do I and I, so we have to be clean. Verse 12. Nor go out 
nor go out of the set-apart place, nor profane the set-apart place of his Elohim. For the sign of dedication, we say levication, of the anointing oil of his Elohim, or his God, is upon him. I am Hashem. I am Yahweh Jah. Verse 13. And let him take a wife in her maidenhood, a widow, or one put away, or a defiled woman, or a whore, these he does not take, but a maiden of his own people he does take as a wife. This is more strict recommendations and, and, and not, not just suggestions, but mitzvah commands for the priest and the high priest, especially. But because we're all, like I said before, because we're all called to be priests through the Most High Jah, even more so through his majesty, God, Father, and King is the one true King of Kings in Yahshua HaMashiach, our Lord. We have to we have to be pure. Strive our best to be pure. Can somebody can a woman, for example, who was caught up in prostitution, you know, Salika, if she was caught up in prostitution or actual whoredom, been with many men, you know, slept with men for money and or even something as uh as simple as border you know, what they call borderline prostitution. That borderline prostitution, which is your strip clubs. I've shared this on previous vids. I'm not perfect. I've, I've even walked in a path of faith in the past recent 10 to 15, 20 years. I've slipped up, you know, once or twice. I've gone to these places that I should not even step foot in because of my faith, because of who I am. But we're human. And guess what? I've had to pay the piper as far as the hands of karma judgment. God is merciful. God is merciful. So, you know, if you don't want to lose money and you wonder why, even now, I'm just now receiving the blessings the financial blessings in my life. I've had the spiritual blessings for quite some time, which is most important, but the, the financial blessings are catching up now to keeping these commandments. But it's taking a long time. I'm 42 now. So believe me, I've worked at my own karma judgment through trial and error, through trials and tribulations, and good choices and bad choices and all the above. Trust me. But before we proceed in that, when I say karma judgment, some people get all dogmatic. You know, they, they want to get uh, dogmatic. Excuse me. But I can say dramatic as well. But they get dogmatic and too religious. And they say, oh, well, you can't say karma. Karma is a pagan word and it's not in the Bible. Well, whatever you want to call it. Karma judgment. It's all the same thing. You think it's not, but it is the same thing. Let's meditate on that. You know, we all have to reap what we sow in this present life, and more so in the life to come. <clears throat> you know, and Jah is merciful. That's where his grace comes in. That's where the atonement comes in, through Messiah, through Christ. But his commandments, the foundation of his Torah, the basic foundation of his laws, statutes, and commandments is to be kept, to be loved and kept. 100% faith and 100% grace. So let's uh, meditate. Let's let's take time to iditate, as, as I and I say, you know, iditate in these scriptures, so we can properly digest and not make the same mistakes that these hippo Christians, as opposed to true Orthodox Christians or pre-Constantine Christians, fellow Israelites, but those who call themselves Christians, caught up in dispensationalism. Mm -hmm. We brought that out. This is why so many other types of Rastas get caught up in Rastaism and schisms because they're rightfully rebelling against the the, the dark side of, of, of Gentile Christianity or mainstream Christendom. But then they, they don't know how to throw out the they don't know how to not throw out the baby with the bathwater. It's a problem. Because you can't you can't be true Rasta or Rastafari without the teachings of his majesty. The teachings of his majesty, Karamawi Hale Selassie, says for my part, I glory in the Bible. So we have to glory in the Bible, in the Torah, in Jah Torah of life. Know his commandments. And love and keep his commandments. To hold the true testimony of Jesus Christ or Yeshua, Messiah. All right, so we left off you know, in uh, verse 14. <clears throat> This is a widow, a one put away or defiled, or defiled woman, 
who are whore, these he does not take. But a maiden of his own people, he does take as a wife. Now, that was according to lineage and of faith. Now, through Messiah, it's through faith. Those who are equally yoked of heart through Messiah, but through Christ. But this is, once again, prophetically foreshadowing. This was literal for the priest. Verse 15. Let's, let's get our minds right. So, verse 15. He does not profane his offspring amongst his people, for I am Hashem who set him apart. And Hashem spoke to Moshe, saying, Speak to Aaron, or speak to Aaron, saying, No man of your offspring throughout their generations who has any defect is to draw near to bring the bread of his Elohim. <clears throat> this is just a symbolism with a prophetical foreshadowing and also spiritually symbolic for the perfection of Elohim, the perfection of, of Hashem through Yeshua as well. Also prophetically foreshadowing Mashiach or Messiah in the first advent, that being Christ in that first advent as our Lord and Savior. He was perfect, the perfect sacrifice is that sacrificial lamb. The Torah became flesh. The word became flesh and lived amongst us. So, <clears throat> Salika. All right. Still having to deal with the allergies in this uh, spring season. For any man who has a defect is not to draw near. A man blind or one lame or disfigured or deformed. Verse 19. A man who has a broken foot or a broken hand. Verse 20. Or is he a hunchback or a dwarf? Or a man who has a defect in his eye, or eczema, or a scab, or is a eunuch. No man amongst the offspring of Aaron the priest, who has a defect, is to come near to bring offerings made by fire to Hashem. Also that spiritual fire, as we digest in the true Christ mind. He has a defect. He does not come near to bring the bread of his Elohim. He does eat the bread of his Elohim. The bread of his, his God, true living, almighty God, El Shaddai. But he does not come near to bring the bread of his Elohim. He does eat the bread of his Elohim, both the set apart and the set apart, mostly. So verse 22, he does eat the bread of his Elohim, both the most set apart and the set apart. Verse 23, only he does not go near the veil or approach the slaughter place because he has a defect. So it's not like cutting people off from coming to the temple or the, the tabernacle to give their offerings and their sacrifice for guilt, you know, guilt offerings, burnt offerings, sin offerings, so they can be forgiven and atoned for. That innocent bloodshed of kosher animals, that exchange and compensation of the universe, you know, that you know, that gives us gives us atonement and that connection with Jah love, that connection with Hashem's love and salvation, so that we can be saved along with our works of loving and keeping his commandments and walking in love and standing upright and striving to striving to do good to our fellow neighbors and to mankind to carry out job works. See, so he does not go near the veil or approach the slaughter place because he has a defect lest he profanes my set apart places for I am Hashem. This is I am Ahaya or Ahia. This is I am Hashem. The name Yahweh Jah, who sets them apart. Verse 24 Thus Moshe or Moses spoke to Aaron and his sons, to all the children of Israel. It's both ethnic and spiritual Israel today through Messiah, through Christ. <clears throat> Even back then in Old Covenant times, it was also to the righteous uh, sojourners who joined up from other nations, even Gentiles according to flesh, that joined up with Israel to re revere Elohim. So, anyway, let us move on to chapter 22. Hmm. Keep that caffeine coming. It's been a long day. Ah. All right. Pause the cause one second here. Yeah. All right. Chapter twenty two. 
And Hashem, or the Lord, Yahweh, spoke to Moshe, the great prophet Moses, saying, Speak to Aaron and his sons, that they separate themselves from the set-apart offerings of the children of Israel. Yes, yes I children of Yashara, and that they do not profane my set-apart name and what they set apart to me, I am Hashem. So we don't profane the name, but that's the name, Hashem, the, Mo the Most High Jah, you know, through strange fire or any kind of rebellion or disobedience or even lack of gnosis, that lack of knowledge. So, say to them, any man of all your offspring throughout your generations who draws near the set-apart offerings which the children of Israel set apart to Hashem, while he has uncleanness upon him, that being shall be cut off from before me. I am Hashem. That's strict discipline and a serious business. Any man of the offspring of Aaron who is a leper or is a discharge does not eat the set-apart offerings until he is clean. And whoever touches what is rendered unclean by a being or a man who has had an emission of semen. So yeah, I mean, this, that's you're not clean if you have discharge or certain, you know, fluids, from, you know, certain fluids that come from our body, certain stains, semen stains. Come on now, you know, it has to be clean and perfect before I shun. That's my lady calling. Pause the cause. Okay, we're back. We're back. So once again, any man of the offspring of Adon, this is this is not just an average faithful Hebrew Israelite. This is of the offspring of, of Adon. Now through the ultimate high priest today, you're also his sons through Messiah, through Christ. But anyone of Adon who is a leper or has a discharge in that Levitical bloodline, tribe of Levi, who has a discharge or does not eat the set apart offerings until he is clean, and whoever touches what is rendered unclean by a being or a man who has had an emission of semen, verse 5, or a man who touches any swarming creature by which he would be made unclean, or any being by whom he would become unclean, even any of his uncleanness. Verse 6, the being who has touched it shall be unclean until evening and does not eat the set-apart offerings, but shall bathe his body in water, that purification, that mikvah, foreshadowing of baptism. Verse 7, and when the sun goes down, he shall be clean. And afterward, eat the set-apart offerings, because it is his food. So there's grace. Even Hashem is merciful and full of grace in these old covenant times as well, as he always has been. It does not change, right? So, <clears throat> so go back to uh, his food, verse 8. And he does not eat that which dies or is torn by beasts, becoming unclean by it. I am Hashem. No roadkill. No. Verse 9. And they shall guard my charge, lest they bear sin for it, and die thereby. When they profane it, I, Hashem, set them apart. Verse 10. And no stranger eats the set-apart offering. A sojourner with the priest or a hired servant does not eat the set-apart offering. See? Certain priestly order for certain positions. Because this is a kind of a cosmic reflection with a spiritual and cosmic reflection of the celestial Zion. You know, we have the Zion upon earth, wherever the Ark of the Covenant dwells. Today we see Judeo-Christian Ethiopia, the heartland of Mother Africa, that monarchy of David, the Ark of the Covenant. Where his imperial majesty, Kanamawi Hale Selassie, his imperial majesty, Kanamawi Hale Selassie the first set up on the throne of, of David, or David, and that, that monarchy of David, the Ark of the Covenant. You see that invasion of Italy, of uh, ancient Rome, of that Goliath, that Goliath, attacking that little David, that, that hidden kingdom of David. We see that victory of Judeo-Christian Ethiopia over Mussolini and the Italians in World War II. <clears throat> we see the preservation, the preservation of Ethiopia, all of the continent of Mother Africa. So you can't make this up. Anyways. I'll stop right there. But uh, it says that uh, there's grace when the sun goes down. 
and no stranger eat to the set apart offering. Of course, there were sojourners who were adopted Israelites in a sense, as there are to, as there are today through Christ. As true Christians were called to be spiritual Israelites, <clears throat> but were not of the ethnic seed. As first to the ethnic Yehudi, or the ethnic Ethiopian Hebrew, according to flesh, then to the righteous Gentiles like myself of other nations grafted in through Yah's grace and, and Yeshua. But uh, it says, verse 11, But when the priest buys a being with his silver, he does eat of it. And one who was born in his house does eat his food. Verse 12, And when a priest's daughter is married to a stranger, she does not eat of the set-apart offerings. Verse 13, But when a priest's daughter is a widow or put away and has no child and has returned to her father's house, as in her youth, she does eat her father's food, but no stranger eats of it. Verse 14. And when a man eats the set-apart offering by mistake, by mistake, then he shall give a set-apart offering to the priest and add one-fifth to it. Wow. A priest's daughter is a widow put away, has no child, is returned to her father's house. She does not eat her father's food. She's still saved by Yah's grace. Hashem's grace, of course. She's still a righteous, considered a righteous Israelite woman, or a righteous woman, but uh, it's just specific guidelines and instructions. This isn't talking about an average Hebrew Israelite home. <clears throat> this is the priesthood, you know, which made atonement for all those who revered Elohim in that time. See? So, and that's that one-fifth of one-fifth of adding to uh, the offering to the priest. Verse 15, And let the priest, or the Kohanim, not profane the set-apart offerings of the children of Israel, which they lift up to Hashem. Verse 16, Or allow them to bear crookedness of trespass when they eat their set-apart offerings. For I am Hashem, I, I am Yahweh, who sets them apart. Verse 17, And Hashem spoke to Moshe, saying, Speak to Aaron and his sons, to all the children of Israel, and say to them, Any man of the house of Israel, or the strangers in Israel those grafted in, who brings his offering, or any of his vows, or for any of his voluntary offerings, which they bring to Hashem as an ascending offering. Verse 19, For your acceptance is a male, a perfect one, from the cattle, from the sheep, or from the goats. All kosher animals. Verse 20. Whatever has a defect, you do not bring, for it is not acceptable for you. Perfection. A perfect sacrifice. Kind of like Christ himself in that first advent. Verse 21. And when a man brings a slaughtering of peace offerings to Hashem and to the Lord, to bring complete a vow or a voluntary offering from the cattle or the sheep, it is to be perfect, to be accepted. Let there be no defect in it. Verse 22. Those blind or broken or cut or having an ulcer or eczema or scabs, you do not bring to Hashem, nor make any offering by fire of them on the slaughter place to Hashem. Now, in that digesting that properly, mentally, spiritually, um, you read these scriptures, you know, our walk with them, our repentance is our sacrifice now through Messiah. We pray to the Father. Pray to Hashem as the Father in the name of the Son, Jesus Christ, or Yeshua, right? Even through His Majesty, the King of Kings and Christ, Yeshua. So pray to Jah the Father in the name of Jesus Christ, the Son, the Messiah. You know, and that is perfection. Your 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 daily prayers, your daily meditation, and your supplications when you um, have repentance or teshuva, as we properly say in the Hebrew. That is a cosmic shift of the heart and mind. It has to be a perfect repentance that's honest and genuine from the heart. See, that's how we digest these scriptures. Perfection, see. So, as for a bull or a lamb that has any limb deformed or dwarfed to you, any limb deformed or dwarfed, you do prepare as a voluntary offering. But for a vow, it is not accepted. Verse 24, And to bring to Hashem, what is bruised or crushed or torn or cut 
nor do it in your land, and from a son of a stranger's hand, do not bring any of these as the bread of your Elohim, for their corruption is in them, and defects are in them, and they are not acceptable for you. Verse 26, And Hashem spoke to Moshe, saying, When a bull, or a sheep, or a goat is born, it shall be seven days with its mother, and from the eighth day, and thereafter, it is acceptable as an offering made by fire to Hashem. So that has to be, think about it. There has to be a seven-day cycle, the divine number of seven, in God or Elohim and perfection. Also a completion, you complete seven days in a week. And on the eighth day, because a seven-day cycle has to pass through in that perfection of the seven-day Sabbath. See? So, once again, um, the eighth day, is, it is acceptable as an offering made by fire to Hashem. Yes, 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 yes. Sorry, I lost my place for a second. Um, but do not slay a cow, verse 28, or a sheep and its young on the same day. And when you slaughter a slaughtering of thanksgiving to Hashem, and thanks to the Most High Yahweh, thanks to the Most High Jah, the Father, slaughter it for your acceptance. It is eaten that same day, leave none of it until morning. I am Hashem, I am the Lord Yahweh, and you shall guard my commands as you shall keep my commandments. You shall guard my mitzvah and my commands and do them. I am Hashem. Verse 32. And do not profane my set apart name. Don't blaspheme his name. That's one of the main Ten Commandments, right? Well, he says, do not profane my set apart name, being the Shem or Hashem, Yahweh, Jehovah. And I shall be set apart amongst the children of Israel. I am Hashem who sets you apart. He makes us set apart. He makes us holy and set apart through his grace his love and salvation, to his atonement, and we in our own free will revere to his will, to love and keep his commandments. See, it always leads back to that foundation of, of Torah. The foundation of Jah Torah is a way of life, you know, it's a true liberty, not a religion. Let's make, make that very clear, you know, because too much ism and schism has crept in with all these false religions in this day and age. Yes, verse 33. Well, let's go back to the very end of uh, verse 32. I am Hashem, I am the Lord Yahweh Jah, who set you apart, who brought you out of the land of Mitzrayim, verse 33, to be your Elohim, the land of Egypt, or bondage, to be your God. I am Hashem, verse 23. And Hashem spoke to Moshe, or to the great prophet Moses, or Musa, saying, Speak to the children of Israel and say to them, the appointed times of Hashem, which you are to proclaim as set apart gatherings. Uh, we're in the, the infamous Leviticus 23. Right? You're in Vayukura or Vayukura chapter 23. The appointed feast days. The Mohodim of Jah's feast. And his commandments. Along with the seven day weekly Shabbat. The true seven day Sabbath. And the other appointed feasts we are to love and keep. Right? All right, Leviticus chapter 23, verse 1. And Hashem, or the name Yahweh Jah, spoke to Moshe, to the great prophet Moses, saying, Speak to the children of Israel and say to them, The appointed times of Hashem, which you are to proclaim as set apart gatherings, my appointed times are these. Verse 3 Six days work is done, but the seventh day is a Sabbath of rest. To seven day Shabbat or the Sunbath. Once again, the seventh day is a Sabbath of rest, not the first day. Now, in the original Ethiopian Orthodox Christian faith, as well as other more true Orthodox, you know, churches of more of a true Christian faith, <clears throat> despite some of the Orthodoxy and traditions that kind of shifted over from even some of the uh, Catholicos, you know. Some of the Catholic churches, but even in the Orthodox Christianity, even in Ethiopian Orthodox, the first original Orthodox Christian faith of Tawahado, the Tawahado Church, 
the first day or so-called Sunday is a, is a Sabbath too. It's a type of Sabbath because if you go to church, we do rest. We can also rest on that day if something happens on, on Shabbat. But even in the true Orthodox Christian faith, the seventh day Sabbath is the seventh day. The scriptures say the seventh day is a Sabbath of rest, a true seventh day Shabbat, a set apart gathering. You do no work. It is a Sabbath to Hashem, a Sabbath to the Lord, Yahweh, in all your dwellings. Verse 4. These are appointed times of Hashem, set apart gatherings, which you are to proclaim at their appointed times. In the first new moon or new month, on the 14th day of the new moon, between the evenings is the Pesach to Hashem. Well, we're going back to this again because we just talked about this in the previous month, month and a half. Um, you could even just, you know, pause for the cause, go back and onto my YouTube page and click on videos <clears throat> to scroll down a little ways. And you'll see where I, you know, I was just celebrating Passover and I put out a video on, um, how to, you know, how to, uh, have a Passover Seder celebration, you know, for beginners just coming into this truth. Um, but once again, the first new month which Abib, the first Hebrew month, which took place in this past month, month and a half. Um, the first month on the 14th day of the new moon, between the evenings, is the Pesach, or Passover, to Hashem, the Lord Yahweh. <clears throat> Verse 6. And on the 15th day is the new moon, is the festival of Matzot, to Hashem. Seven days you eat unleavened bread, Matzah. So we already did that. And... I have previous videos breaking down the importance, the symbolism of the original people of Israel, ethnic Hebrew Israelites that were in bondage and slavery, and those righteous sojourners that also joined up with them in that first exodus, that first Passover, and that first exodus out of out of bondage. See, also foreshadowing the coming of Christ or Messiah in that first advent, who was the Passover Lamb, who was the final Passover Lamb, is Yeshua. Jesus Christ, the Messiah, and that first advent is our Lord and Savior, right? Crucified upon the cross, that lamb. So, yeah, now we're able to connect the dots and see the importance of why we keep the commandments. And these commandments, the foundation of this Torah, has never been done away with, but fulfilled as Yeshua or Jesus Christ himself says in Matthew, go to Matit um, Yahu or St. Matthew, chapter 5, verse 17. Come not to abolish Torah, but fulfill. He was and he is the living Torah made flesh. Okay. So, on the 15th day of this new moon, <clears throat> is the festival of Salika, the festival of Matzot, is unleavened bread to Hashem. Seven days you eat unleavened bread, or matzah. We did that. I thought about that in the previous previous uh, bids about a month ago. <clears throat> Salika. On the first day, verse 7, you have a set-apart gathering. Do no servile work. So on that first day, the eve of the 14th day, the eve of that that day, we do no work. Like a seven-day Sabbath, we shall rest on that day. It is, a high, it is a high holy Sabbath that we are still to love and keep, especially in Christ Yeshua. Especially in Christ Jesus, Yeshua. To you Christians, genuine Christians who are coming in and just now tuning into these videos who have a, a hunger for the real truth, according to this word. All right, so verse eight, and you shall bring an offering made by fire to Hashem for seven days. On the seventh day, as they set apart gathering, you do no servile work. So the first and seventh day of the first day is 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 a uh, Passover. You know the whole the whole uh, feast is Passover or Pesach, but it's really the twilight, <clears throat> the first day, which is kind of the Passover meal, and then we go into what we call the feast of unleavened bread. For seven days, on the first and seventh day, we rest like a regular weekly Shabbat. This 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 uh, particular year, in the past month or two, we've <clears throat> we just uh, realized that it happened to fall on uh, the seven day Shabbat or the weekly Sabbath at the same time. So it, it was actually a high holy Sabbath or a double Sabbath. You know, the seven day weekly Shabbat and then the high holy Shabbat being the seventh day of, of, of unleavened bread, the Passover. So, you know, it's, it's 
is obedience. It's kind of that symbolism of, of one and seven. The first and the last shall be first. The first shall be last. And vice versa. So, when you bring an offering made by fire to Hashem, to the Lord, Yahweh, or Jehovah, your fire is through your prayers, your spiritual fire through the Holy Spirit in the name of Jesus Christ, or Yeshua, in the name of Jesus Christos, the Messiah in the first advent, as our spiritual fire, the Holy Spirit. He is the final sacrificial lamb, so we should, everything else, we, we keep the commandments, we have a feast, bring your friends and family and fellow spiritual brothers and sisters that are open to the truth, in Christ, in Messiah, in, in that fulfilled Christ spirit, or anyone who's open, anyone who's open to the truth. Invite them over to your house or go over to someone else's house who, who is like minded of this true faith. You know, fellow elect Christian Rastafari or even a messianic brother or sister or an Orthodox Christian brother or sister that's also in tune with the Mohadim of the feast. These are not just Jewish feasts amongst the other so called Jews. And I'm not, I'm not making any blanket statements because, as I say, here at LDA, we don't make blanket statements. I have a lot of love and respect, a high level of love and respect for fellow Torah observants, Yahudim amongst the other Yahudim. Whether some of them might have a little bit of Afro-Shemitic connections like the Ethiopian Yahudim or the authentic Ethiopian Jews and Hebrew Israelites of different tribes, according to lineage. But some might have a little bit of that. Some of them might just be converts, but they're genuine converts. I'm not talking about the Zionist, you know, uh, Ashkenazi, Khazarim. You know, the, the Zionist powers of Hasatan or the synagogue of Satan. I'm not talking about that. But anyways, you know, go to a fellow brother or sister's house or, or you know, a messianic synagogue or a church, true Orthodox Christian church that may practice Pesach or Fasica and, and be obedient or just have it at your home. If you're just a lone ranger and, you, and you're just by yourself, do it in solitude if you have to. Take that day off, the first and the seventh day off. You know, look at the moon cycles. Look up, you can look up so-called Jewish holidays, but it's not Jewish holidays. It's Yahweh's feast. It's Jah's feast and commandments for the true body of Messiah, both true ethnic and true spiritual Israel. For anybody of any race or nationality to be joined in, grafted in through his grace in Messiah, to partake and to keep. These are Yahweh's feasts, or God's feast. Okay? So... Verse 9, And Hashem spoke to Moshe, saying, Speak to the children of Israel, and you shall say to them, When you come into the land which I give you, and shall reap its harvest, then you shall bring a sheaf of the first fruits of your harvest to the priest. We had that video based off first fruits, and I titled you know, Rastafari first fruits. It was, happened to be the day after the, the seven-day weekly Sabbath, or that weekly Shabbat, following the seventh day of unleavened bread after Passover. Then you have this, once again, this year, in the past month, a month and a half, I happened to fall on the seven-day Sabbath as well. So the day after that would be so-called Sunday or first day of the next week. We have to count seven weeks, seven Sabbaths, not, not just weekly cycles, but seven, seven Shabbats. So, we have the first fruits is that day after the seven day which happened to also fall on so-called Easter Sunday. That's a lot of extra extended. That's a lot of extra extended grace through Hashem's grace, through Jah's love, through through Christ, to a lot of the majority of so-called Christians in this world to open their eyes, give them a chance to open their eyes. Still, most of them probably said Happy Easter, and there's some grace in saying that. But when they said Happy Happy Easter, and they got the little little kids running around with Easter egg baskets, and then, yeah, pff, nothing to do with the resurrection of Christ or first fruits. We also see that resurrection season, you know, this part of the earth, this portion of the earth begins to resurrect. The trees begin blossoming and blooming and the flowers start blossoming and it gets warmer and you see that resurrection of life on the earth as well. So a beautiful thing. But it says that uh, you should bring a sheaf of the first fruits for your harvest to the priest. You saw that some, I got some uh, branches in the backyard, you know, even living here in the city had some some vines and branches from the backyard, you know, brought into my table during um, unleavened bread. It says he shall wave the sheep before Hashem for your acceptance on the morrow, which in the day, the morrow after the Sabbath, the priest waves it. And that time it was the high priest. Now it's you know the high priest through the King of Kings and Yeshua. As above, so below. 
So there you go. You have that the lamb is taken care of. The sacrificial lamb is taken care of, uh, or some say the Passover lamb. The high priest is, is there. That's that's taken care of. Okay. We still bring that sheaf. It's a good to take that action and bring it before Hashem. You know, uh, last month I had my table set up upstairs in the dining room here in the house <clears throat> with the shofar and the menorah, seven candles, the beautiful thing. Anyways, you shall wave a sheep before Hashem, you know, wave it before the Most High, say hallelujah, praise Ijah, you know, and Hashem Yeshua, give thanks and praises. That's that spiritual fire we offer to Hashem as well. <clears throat> the priest waves it. And on that day, when you wave the sheaf, you prepare a male lamb, a year old, a perfect one, and a sinning offering to Hashem. That's the blood of Yeshua today, the blood of Jesus Christ, the Messiah. Verse 13. And this green offering, two tenths of an ephah of fine flour mixed with oil, an offering made by fire. Once again, an offering made by fire to Hashem, the spiritual fire of the Ruach HaKodesh, of the Holy Spirit, that will Memphis caduce of the true spirit within Christ today. So we pray in the name of Yahshua HaMashiach. And you still have the matzah and the Passover meal and you keep that seven days of unleavened bread. Yeah. Salesman. That's how you, you offer your fine flour in a spiritual sense, metaphysically. See, people don't connect the dots with this. It's the priesthood that's been transitioned, not the commandments, not the actual mitzvah or the feast that we're, we're still supposed to keep, especially in Christ, according to what the Bible says. I don't know, I don't know about your Bible. <clears throat> Maybe you have some kind of other translation of a Bible that I, that I don't have that says anything different. And the thing is, it says the morrow after. So... Keep in mind, um, most of the, uh, amongst the other Yahudim, all due respect, not the Zionists, but most of the faithful fellow Torah observant uh, other Jews amongst the Eurocentric Yahudim within, I want to say Judaism, I want to say Judaism, and other types of fulfilled Judaism to an extent, but in Judaism, something is different. In, in Judaism, as well as Judaism, we have all the feast days, we call so-called Jewish holidays, or Yas Feast. It's part of Yas Feast that we are to love and keep. Most of the other Jews, you know, have that right within Judaism or Judaism. Despite the ism and schisms, they have that right as far as the appointed times. That's knowledge that was taken from the original Yahudim, the Ethiopian uh, Falasha, or the Ethiopian Jews. And the original Hebrew Israelites, according to lineage, the African Hebrew Israelites, and those of the Northern Kingdom as well, according to flesh and blood. So they, they got that from that. But, you know, some of them were genuine converts and still are more genuine converts today. Not even just other Messianic Yahudim, but even some of the Orthodox. But where the ism and schisms come in to modern Judaism, as opposed to true fulfilled Judaism as a way of life, which is which is parallel to that fulfilled Israelite faith or that true, you know, pre-Constantine Christian faith, if we like to say it that way, as well as the true Orthodox faith of his majesty as a liberty or as a way of life. Salika. It is the morrow or the day after the Sabbath, the priest waves it, which is following Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread. So, then we count seven weeks, just this basic reading comprehension, but within Judaism, it seems like, and I don't mean, even really mean the disrespect, to be honest with you, I don't. Because Hashem still, you know, John knows people's hearts and their zeal and still receives some spiritual blessings because of that, I'm sure. But we don't count the, the second or third day of, of unleavened bread after Pesach or Passover during that Fasica season. We count the more after, as it says, the more after, as it says in the Torah. Therefore, so-called Shavuot within the blueprint of Judaism will say that uh, Shavuot, or the so-called Feast of Weeks, is on this day of this month, in parallel to the Gregorian calendar of this month of May, May the whatever, the whatever teenth, when really it's uh, it's the week after that, or it's a few days, it's a few days after that of uh, of this month. Uh, both Hebraically and Gregorically speaking, you know, in the month of May, it's towards the end of this month, which is the actual Shavuot, as well as the day of Pentecost. So, uh, those who disagree, 
those who might be watching this vid and cursing me out saying, what is this, what is this uh, Irish white man or this Gentile know about Judaism or Shavuot? Okay, well, I'm about to show you. Um, verse 12, and on that day when you wave the sheaf, you prepare a male lamb, a year old, a perfect one, and is sending offering to Hashem. Verse 13, and it's grain offering, two tenths of an ephah of fine flour mixed with oil, and an offering made by fire, a spiritual fire to Hashem, to the Lord, a sweet fragrance, and it's drink offering, one fourth of a hen of wine. Again, it's a Hebrew custom and special occasions. Right now, I'm just drinking my Jesus wine or Yeshua wine. It's H2O. I'm not drinking, I'm not partaking of wine this week. I need to give myself some rest. I'm partaking the lamb's bread on a regular, on a regular basis. But you know, the lamb's bread. Outside of matzah or unleavened bread was the only kosher bread or idol bread that we, we partake in if we choose to during Pesach or during un unleavened bread. So anyways, verse 14, and you do not eat bread or roasted grain or fresh grain until that same day that you have brought an offering to your Elohim, to your God, a law forever throughout your generations and all your dwellings. Regular bread, you, you have to eat the unleavened bread. It's a symbolism, spiritual foreshadowing in that, that rising, that leaven that makes the, the bread rise, you know, but we take that leaven out of our hearts through purification, through meditation, and, you know, daily prayers and repentance, and all that is a purification of the heart, too. So let's move on. Verse 15. And from the morrow after the Sabbath, from the day that you brought the sheaf of the wave offering, you shall count for yourselves seven completed Sabbaths. Until the morrow after the seventh Sabbath, until you count 50 days, then you shall bring a new grain offering to the Lord, to Hashem, you know, to the name Yahweh, Jehovah. So, basic reading comprehension from the same original Hebrew scriptures in the same written Torah, or Tanakh, or in the Bible. So, it's interesting how some, in all due respect, but it's kind of interesting how some of the other Jews, not all, but some of the other Yahudim will kind of mix that up and say, well, they only count like the second or third day of unleavened bread as their version of so-called first fruits. But look, now if we, if we compare that to like when Messiah was actually crucified or impaled upon the stake or the cross, they, you know, a couple of days after the first day of Passover, okay, we, we can we can look at it from that extent, but this this year happened to be the the seventh day. So it's just there's differences in that. All due respect, but let's go by what the scripture says, and this is parallel to what the Karite Jews. Now, some other Orthodox Jews observe this, and some of the Messianic Jews, Yahudim, amongst the other Jews um, and other Gentiles, grafted into that 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 uh, mindset from more of a Eurocentric perspective. But all due respect, as fellow spiritual Israelites and Messiah. But they, they uh, you know, Hashem re rewards them based off their knowledge and their heart, of course. You know, so we'll get too legalistic about this, but let's deal with facts. Besides a certain amount of Orthodox Jews or Messianic Jews, you have the Karaites, the Karaite Jews in parts of the land of Israel. And I'm not talking about the Israeli government or the Zionist powers and none of that. But the, in that land of Israel, which is still the land given to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, along with Arabia and parts of Ethiopia and Africa. Yes, yes, all of that given to Abraham through Isaac and Jacob. But, uh, yeah, we just got to read the scriptures. It's the morrow after. I'll read it again. I'm not making this up. This is the only part of Judaism that's off. Every every other feast or, or Moed, all the other Mohudim rely on the exact days according to the original, same original Hebrew calendar. And other camps and other types of Israelites and Orthodox Christians and other Christians will, Jews will twist things around or have different, I shouldn't say twist things around, but they have different days for different reasons based off the sliver of the moon, you know, whatever. As long as you're practicing and keeping these commandments within season, 
But at the same time, with all that being said, the actual authentic days are, are even amongst the, the, the other Jews, and even not just true Orthodox Jews, even some of the other Khazarian and so-called Jews, a lot of them still practice in the same days. They have, they have the days right according to the same original Hebrew calendar of the ancient Hebrew Israelites from ancient times to this present time. They have that according to that lunar cycle. Okay, but this, when it comes to Shavuot, it seems within popular mainstream Judaism, Orthodox Judaism and schisms, it seems like this is the one day, the one feast they have off. <laughs> because it's not going by what their scriptures say in the same original Hebrew translations. So, <clears throat> here we go. And yes, I'm reading from a scriptures book right here. But it's, in, it's also in your Christian Bibles. Just read it. So, <clears throat> once again, once again, uh, and from the morrow after the Sabbath, Following unleavened bread, Passover, from that day that you brought the sheaf of the wave offering, you shall count for yourselves seven completed Sabbaths. Verse 16, until the morrow after the seventh Sabbath, you count 50 days, so it's also equivalent to seven weeks, Shavuot, 50 days. Then you shall bring a new grain offering to Hashem. Again, so that is relevant as far as the action of, of the mitzvah or command we're supposed to keep. A wave offering, two loaves of bread, regular leavened bread, and that symbolized resurrection. In this resurrection season. It's a very beautiful thing. You know? But uh, from your dwellings, for a wave offering, two loaves of bread, two tenths of an ephah of fine flour, they are baked with leaven, first fruits to Hashem. Yahweh, Jah, Hallelujah. Rastafari, Yah, Selassie, verse 18. Besides the bread, you shall bring seven lambs, the divine number of seven, completion, perfection. Right, that cycle that's also covered by Yah's grace, or through Yah's grace, through Yeshua, through His majesty, through His imperial majesty in Jesus Christos, or Yeshua, in the first advent, seven lambs. So just pray to the Father, Yah, pray to the Most High, Yah, the Father, in the name of Yeshua, or Jesus Christ, done. <clears throat> as far as keeping that, that mitzvah of the feast. So, besides bread, you should bring seven lambs, a year old, perfect ones, and one young bull and two rams. They are an ascending offering to Hashem with their grain offering and their drink offerings, an offering made by fire for a sweet fragrance to Hashem, to the Lord, Yahweh. Verse 19, And you shall offer one male goat as a sin offering, and two male lambs as a year old, as a slaughter of peace offerings. By Hashem Yeshua, in the name of Jesus Christ, it's covered. So definitely pray to the Father in the name of the Son, in the name of Yeshua. In the name of Jesus Christ, the Son, covered. Okay? They are sending offering to Hashem with their grain offerings and their drink offerings, <clears throat> an offering made by fire for a sweet fragrance to Hashem. Verse 19. And you shall offer one male goat as a sin offering, and two male lambs a year old as a slaughter of peace offerings. By Hashem, Yeshua HaMashiach, covered through the blood of the covenant. In the name of Jesus Christ, or in the name of Yeshua. All right? Verse 20, and the priest shall wave them besides the bread of the first fruits as a wave offering before Hashem besides the two lambs, the two lambs of symbolizing two messiahs, really one Mashiach, two advents of one Christ, one Elohim, but also two messiahs, two separate incarnations, two separate advents, right? The priest shall wave them besides the bread of first fruits as a wave offering. Besides the two lambs, they are set apart to Hashem for the priests. Verse 21. On the same day, you should proclaim a set-apart gathering for yourselves. You do no servile work on it, a law forever in all your dwellings throughout your generations. That's Shavuot. Also that day of Pentecost. It's also the same, also the same day <clears throat> which the great prophet Moshe or Moses receives the Ten Commandments from Mount Sinai. The ten, the ten words. The Aserat Debarim, as we properly say in the Hebrew, the main Ten Commandments, amongst other mitzvah or commandments and statutes, he receives the Torah, the instructions that revived Torah, became revived through Moshe and to his people Israel since the days of Abraham, Yitzhak, and Yaakov, or Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, even the days of the great prophet Yosef, or the great prophet Joseph in Egypt. They all knew the Torah, even before Abraham, going back to Enoch and the great prophet Noah, and even before even going back to Ha'adam, Adam and Eve, 
You had that Torah that had to be that original Torah of life and the commandments had to be revived through Moses because of so many generations and so many years in Mitzrayim under great slavery and oppression, the influence of, of idol worship and the Nephilim of the satanic influence. They had to, they lost their, their knowledge of themselves. <clears throat> so it had to be revived through Moshe, this Torah. See, so with that being said, On that same day, you should proclaim a set-apart gathering of yourselves. You know, serve our work on it, a law forever. In all your dwellings throughout your generations, it is also the day of Pentecost. Shavuot is the day of Pentecost. When the disciples, the Tamudim of, of Yeshua, or Jesus Christ in the first advent is Messiah, is the one true prophet of all prophets, receive that spiritual mikvah or baptism of the Ruach HaKodesh, that baptism of the Holy Spirit, or that woman Fiskadus, so they could proclaim the good news gospel, which is really the renewed covenant, the Brihadasha, the Brihadasha or the Hadith Kedan, the good news gospel of Jesus Christos, the message of Yeshua, the Messiah, the fulfillment of Torah. So, yeah, all about Christ. All these feasts and commandments and, and just peace foreshadow Messiah. See? All right. So, Verse 22, and when you reap the harvest of your land, do not completely reap the corners of your field. When you reap and do not gather any gleaning from your harvest, leave them for the poor, for the stranger. I am Hashem, your Elohim. That's, you know, burning out, you know, poverty amongst their people. See, that's the way it should be done today. But in America, in the core of daughter Babylon, you have the total opposite. As much money and so-called freedoms we have here, right? Not going to go there. I'm not going to go there in this video. I have too much to talk about right now, but you see it. So, verse 23, And Hashem spoke to Moshe, saying, Speak to the children of Israel, saying, In the seventh new moon, it's the seventh month, which is Tishrei. Now, say, uh, some call the first month Nisan, according to other, you know, Hebraic or even Jewish tradition amongst the other Jews, but it's really Abib. In the seventh month is Tishrei, so they have a lot of the original Hebraic names right as far as the first and seventh month. But really, a lot of these other so-called moons or months within within Judaism, as opposed to Judaism, are names like Tammuz and Babylonian names that they kind of adapted or adopted from from uh, that captivity in Babylon before before Christ. So some of this stuff we just we just call it first month, say in the month of Abib, or first month. Second month, third month, fourth month, fifth month, sixth month, seventh month, or just, you, you get what I'm saying. So, once again, in the seventh new moon, or seventh month, on the first day of the new moon, you have a rest, a remembrance of Tarura, as the Hebrew name for trumpets, as the blessed feast of trumpets, as is in most of your translations of your Bibles and your Tanakhs. A remembrance of Tarura is also Rosh Hashanah. So that gets more confusing. Rosh in the Hebrew sounds sound similar to Ras and the Amharic. Uh, you know, a lot of that revived Hebrew or Masoretic Hebrew came from the uh, Rol Amharic or the Ethiopic Ras or Rosh Hashanah, the head of the new year, a new cycle within a cycle. So we have the, it really is the remembrance of, of trumpets, that calling of the kingdom, the calling of Jah's kingdom or Hashem's kingdom to that body of Messiah, that true body of Christ today. It's the calling of the kingdom, right? All about Christ. It's all foreshadowing Messiah, which is fulfillment of the Torah. The fulfillment of the Torah and the prophets before him. You do no serve our work and you shall bring an offering made by fire to Hashem. So it's a high holy Sabbath, just like the weekly Shabbat. You shall rest, do no work. If you have a shofar, you know, take heed. If you have a trumpet, or if you don't have a shofar or a trumpet or a horn or any, any kind of thing like that, if you have a laptop, which I'm sure most of you have a laptop or a cell phone or something because you're watching this video, um, you know, get on YouTube and <clears throat> type in Shofar, S-H-O-F-A-R, Shofar Blast and Shofar Blowing and all these videos will come up. A Shofar is, is a ram's horn. It's another Hebrew tradition. It stems back from ancient Kemet. You know, in fact, the original Kemet was a more of a Yahweh or Jehovah-based faith before the other 
lures and idols within ancient pseudo Egyptology crept in through uh, through uh, that Nephilim or that Satanic influence. You had the ram, so the symbol of the ram's horn, being the male lamb, like Christ Himself in the first advent. That lamb, or that ram, would be the shofar blast. You know, it's a it's a very spiritual sound. And I do have one here in the house. Let's pause for the cause for one second. Hasatan, the spirits of darkness, hate that sound. Even the wicked man in the flesh of Babylon hate that sound. So yeah, you know, they have a shofar. You can, you can find them at certain places. You can even order them online through Amazon. My brethren, my fellow Torah observant brethren in Christ, Yeshua, who fellowships with the Messianics, he has a huge uh, shofar, a huge ram's horn. He's a professional. <clears throat> he really is a professional in playing the shofar. He can play different notes like a trumpet. But if you don't have a shofar, if you have even a saxophone or a horn, or that's cool. It's the Feast of Trumpets. If you have, if you have an actual trumpet, you know, just play and rejoice. Play to the Lord, you know. Play to Hashem. You know, a lot of roots reggae music has that 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 horn section. And a lot of roots reggae music, you know, that kind of gives it that fulfillment, that majestic sound. So, all the above. Anyway, let us proceed. <clears throat> so, go. And once again, you do no servile work, and you shall bring an offering made by fire to Hashem. That spiritual obedience and giving thanks and praise and to your prayers and supplications and meditation, that spiritual fire through the Ruach HaKodesh. Okay? So, verse 26. And Hashem, for the name Yahweh, spoke to Moshe, saying, On the tenth day of the seventh new moon, or seventh month, which usually falls, uh, Gregorically speaking, in the month of September, usually it's always September, sometimes it goes off into October, between September and October, when the lunar cycles, according to the Hebraic calendar. Fall. You know, and a lot of times uh, in the solar, those solar cycles, Ethiopically, we make that connection with the fast of the mescal. We even go back to September 11th, Gregorically speaking, in parallel with the Ethiopic calendar. And they have that, you know, Ethiopian New Year, which is usually pretty close to Rosh Hashanah, or trumpet. So you have the, the wheel within the wheel or the cycle within the cycles. See. So no... So our work is done on any of these uh, moets or these feasts, <clears throat> just like the seven day Sabbath, who the weekly Shabbat is one of the seven feasts. And Hashem spoke to Moshe saying on the 10th day of the seventh new month, our moon is Yom HaKippurim, the day of atonement. Some say Yom Kippur amongst the, uh, the other Jews within Judaism. You know, all due respect, it's Yom Kippur, the day of atonement or atonements. So Yom HaKaparim, it shall be a set-apart gathering for you, and you shall afflict your beings, that means through prayers and fasting, spiritual fasting, physical fasting as well. Afflict your beings, and you shall bring an offering made by fire to Hashem. Verse 28, and you do no work on that same day, for it is Yom Kippurim, Day of Atonement. Yom Kippur, to make atonement for you before Hashem, your Elohim. Verse 29. For any being who is not afflicted on that same day, he shall be cut off from his people. Serious, man. So, you know, in, in uh, parallel to the original Ethiopian Orthodox Judeo-Christian faith, or that, that Tawahedo liberty, you had the fast of the cross, the fast of the mescal, that true Christian cross, you know, and very interesting. You know, you kind of wonder where this comes from. So there's deeper Afro-Semitic roots. There's true Hebraic roots. So, but it's the lunar cycles of the months and the feasts we're supposed to keep as far as Jah's commandments you know, in fulfillment of Christ. So any being who does any work on that day and fails to keep that day holy and set apart according to the instructions and commandments is cut off from his people. <clears throat> so those of you that have been keeping these feasts and commandments for many years now in this this true faith walk wonder why it's kind of hard to reconnect with certain people that you used to connect with in your social life you know it's very interesting to think about even a lot of so-called christians who say they're christians 
I'm not making any blanket statements at all. I'm just, just saying, food for thought. So, verse 30. And any being who does any work on that same day, that being I shall destroy in the midst of his people. That's even taking it to the next level. So, you know, don't, don't get, don't get uh, turned away by this. This is the commandments of our Heavenly Father. He knows what's best for us. Our Elohim, who is a God of love, first and foremost, a God of love and salvation. Jah is merciful. Hashem is merciful. But obedience is obedience. Commandments are commandments. He doesn't ask. He doesn't, he doesn't expect that much from us. You might think that he does. He doesn't, doesn't, he doesn't expect that much from us after all that Hashem has done for us. After all the Most High Jah has done for us, giving us his Torah through his servants, through the prophets, through his begotten son. The one true prophet of all prophets, even part of his essence through the angel incarnate, the Torah made flesh, to be impaled and crucified on a cross, out of pure love and compassion, to be that final sacrificial lamb and bring us atonement and help us be born again and begotten again to receive eternal life. He doesn't expect that much from us. Come on now. The fear of the Lord is actually reverence, it's a respect and obedience and reverence of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. As it says in um, Proverbs. Chapter 1, verse 7. But anyways. It says, uh, You do no work, a law forever, throughout your generations, and all your dwelling. So it's also also a day, just like the Sabbath. you off off from work. Ask off for that day from your occupation and, and keep the commandments and live. It is a Sabbath of rest to you, and you shall afflict your beings as well as at fasting. Now, if you have it, Severe health conditions, you can avoid that, you know, but if, if not, you fast spiritually through repentance and forgiveness is also a time that some add to the, the 10 days of, of, of awe and all that leading up to like forgiveness of your neighbor and, 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 and repentance, which is good. But, you know, just dealing with the commandments here this time. So <clears throat> it is a Sabbath of rest to you on the ninth day of the new moon at evening. From uh, from evening to evening, sundown to sundown, is when we calculate the Hebraic days. You know? It's like Shabbat from sundown, so-called Friday evening sundown to Saturday evening sundown. But, you know, these other feasts may fall on different times of the week. It could be a Monday, it could be a Tuesday or a Wednesday. So keep in touch with the lunar cycles, or you can cheat and type in Jewish uh, holidays of that year and blah, blah, blah. And it's not really cheating, but, you know, they're not, they're not. They're not Jewish holidays, you know, it's titled that, you know, in the internet, you know, it's, it might be titled on the internet, Jewish holidays, but they're Yahweh's feast, they're Jah's feast, they're Hashem's feast for us to love and keep, especially in Christ, when it comes to that true core body of Christ. And that's not to be self-righteous, but that is to be right and exact, 100%, okay? So, once again... Verse 33, and Hashem, or the name Yahweh, spoke to Moshe, or the great prophet Moses, saying, Speak to the children of Israel, saying, On the fifteenth day of this seventh new moon is the festival of Sukkot. Sukkot, in the Hebrew, which is tabernacle, or booth. For seven days to Hashem, seven days to the Lord. Verse 35, on the first day, as a set-apart gathering, you do no servile work. You know, like another feast day, or a Sabbath day. They are, they're all, in a sense, they're all Sabbaths. They're all high holy Shabbats. For in seven days you bring an offering made by fire to Hashem, to the Lord Yahweh Jah, to your present supplications by Hashem Yeshua. On the eighth day, there shall be a set apart gathering for you, and you shall bring an offering made by fire to Hashem. It is a closing festival. You do no servile work. So the first and the eighth day this time. According to Passover, unleavened bread, it was the first and seventh day. Now it's the first and eighth day. That divine number of eight means to build, or it means like a, a new beginning as well. After that seven cycle completion, all throughout those seven days, <clears throat> we should, you know, if you can, you know, build a little uh, sukkah or a tent. You can even use a pop up tent. Through the modern technology we have, you can just put up a tent in the backyard or on the back porch, like I did this few months ago. I did this past uh, September and October for Sukkot. You're in this new house. I just, living in the city, I just put a little tent. Or actually, I take that back. I did not have a tent. I made my own little sukkah with uh, banners that I have on the wall. Here in the lion's den, I had banners and things set up. I had a mattress 
a blow up mattress out there and my lady stayed, stayed with me a couple nights. So yeah, you didn't have, I didn't have to sleep in it every night. Uh, and then one night, I think one or two nights we, we slept out there in the back porch in the suka, the urban suka. But, uh, no, you can, uh, <clears throat> go camping if you happen to have a few days off or one night off, but you have to have the first and eight day off. But if you happen to have the whole week off, you can go out to the country and set up a tent or, or build a traditional suka, um, more of a Hebrew Israelite traditional sukkah from a more of a biblical standpoint. But either way, it's, it's to obey the mitzvah commandment, the act of how the people of Israel lived in tents, sukkahs, which the definition of sukkah Hebraically is a temporary dwelling. That's kind of our physical bodies of flesh and blood in this present life on earth, looking forward to the kingdom, preparing for the future kingdom, the new resurrection or the new heaven upon earth, that new Zion upon earth. Looking forward to the kingdom. So you have Feast of Trumpets, the calling of Jah Kingdom, the calling of the King of Kings in Christ, that true metaphysical rapture, not look up in the sky to sky Zeus, Jesus, fly me away and think happy thoughts like Peter Pan, the true spiritual metaphysical rapture, which is the calling, the calling of Jah Kingdom to the King of Kings in Christ Jesus Yeshua. Hallelujah. Rastafari. Aliyah Selassie. So this is beautiful things that we're meant to love and keep beautiful you know feasts that are all about the coming of, of, of christ the messiah both in the first and second advent because we have the calling of the king of kings in this regeneration of rastafari see and not everybody who keeps these feasts are necessarily rastafari <clears throat> we know that all due respect must be the coming of christ in the first advent as yeshua our lord and savior Messiah. So, once again, for seven days you bring an offering made by fire that thinks and prays. On the eighth day you shall be set apart, gathering, it should be a set apart gathering for you. You should bring an offering made by fire to Hashem through lighting of candles, through setting up that sukkah, thinks and praise, you know, by Hashem Yeshua. And, uh, it, it, you know, it is a closing festival. Wow. It should be, you shall bring an offering made by fire to the Lord. It is a closing festival. You do no servile work. So you must have all from your occupations and not work. Just like on the weekly Sabbath, the first and eighth day of, of Tabernacles. Verse 37. <clears throat> These are the appointed times of Hashem, which you proclaim as set apart gatherings to bring an offering made by fire to Hashem, to the Lord Yahweh, an ascending offering and a grain offering a slaughtering and a drink offering and commanded for every day. So through every day you say, you say, you know, Baruch Hashem, you know, Father Yahweh, Jah, you know, cover me through the precious blood of the covenant, by Hashem Yeshua HaMashiach. Thank you, you know, HaSameah, for this blessed feast time. You rejoice with the other fellow brethren and sisters that may be of that faith. If you don't have anyone to celebrate with, you, you, still, dwell in, you still dwell in that sukkah or that tabernacle. Even if you make a fort inside of your apartment in the city, make a little fort in your house. And then sometimes if you live in a small apartment, like I did a couple years ago, um, <clears throat> that is that is your sukkah in a sense. Our experience here in North America, in the core of daughter Babylon, <clears throat> is kind of our, our experience here in the, the wilderness of North America. So you could look at it that way, as long as you're keeping observing that day, even the first and eighth day off. Hashem Yeshua HaMashiach. We don't have to be over legalistic about these commandments, but we do have to observe and strive our best to keep these commandments in fulfillment of, of, of Jesus Christ, Yeshua. So, these are the appointed times, verse 37. These are the Mohadim, or the appointed times of Hashem, which you proclaim as set apart gatherings to bring an offering made by fire to Hashem, an ascending offering and a grain offering a slaughtering and drink offerings as commanded for every day. <clears throat> Verse 38, besides the Shabbats of Hashem, besides the Sabbaths of, of the Lord Yahweh, Jah, and besides your gifts, and besides all your vows, and besides all your voluntary offerings, which you give to Hashem. <clears throat> On the 15th day of the seventh new moon or month, when you gather in the fruits of the land, celebrate the festival of Hashem for seven days. On the first day is a rest on the eighth day at rest, verse 40, and you shall take for yourselves on the first day the fruit of good trees, 
branches of palm trees, twigs of leafy trees, and willows of the stream, and shall rejoice before Hashem, your Elohim, for seven days. So uh, that's another thing, kind of in the resurrection season, we went out and took the sheaves, usually during the fall feasts, through, through the fall feast of Hashem, do the same thing, kind of in the things beginning to kind of dry up a little bit, and the leaves begin to change colors and fall off the trees. <clears throat> so, anywhere, palm trees, depending on your where you live. If you live in Florida, you can probably find palm trees pretty easy. Um, but yeah, twigs of leafy trees, willows of the stream, and shall rejoice before Hashem, your Elohim, for seven days, before the Lord your God, for seven days. <clears throat> and the eighth day we also take off as well as, well as the first day to rejoice. And you shall celebrate it, Salika. You shall celebrate it as a festival to Hashem for seven days in, in the year, a law forever in your generations. Celebrate it in the seventh new moon, seventh month. Verse 22, or Salika. Verse 42. Dwell in booths for seven days. All who are native born in Israel dwell in booths so that your generation know that I made the children of Israel dwell in booths or sukkahs or tabernacles, if you will, when I brought them out to the land of Mitzrayim, of Egypt, with his bondage. I am Hashem, your Elohim. Thus did Moshe speak of the appointed times of Hashem to the children of Israel, both ethnic and spiritual Israel, now through Christ, the true core body of Messiah, the true core body of Christ. So these commandments are for us, for all of us, man, who in that true core body of Messiah, truly born again, even, through his, even more so through his majesty, as the one true king of kings in Christ, just as Yeshua. And this is kind of that small mustard seed of Jah kingdom, like Yeshua or Joshua says, like just as Christ says, as, as Messiah in the first advent, he speaks of that mustard seed, you know, where people are still kind of trying to digest and trying to break down the walls of Babylon, which means confusion, and, and really connect the dots in their mind and their heart. Like, wait a minute. Okay, because you think of these Mohadim and these so-called feasts, you think of Jewish or so-called Jewish holidays that amongst the other Jews. No, this is for us as true ethnic and spiritual Israel in the body of Christ, the true body of Christ. So verse, again, chapter 24, let us proceed because in reflection, we dwell in these temporary sukkahs, which are these temples, these, these physical bodies of flesh and blood from the dust of the earth. And then we look forward to, we look forward to that, that future kingdom, both in the heavenly kingdom with our ancestors and in the new kingdom or that resurrection upon earth. You know, when the Messiah is revealed in his, his full glory, whether we're still alive in these bodies of flesh in this life now or in the resurrection, we're going to see it. You know, we look forward to that kingdom. So all about foreshadowing Messiah. It's all about foreshadowing Christ as well as the people of Israel and well as, as well as our spiritual exodus in this present life to salvation. I would love to close right there and say shalom, but here we go, chapter 24. We got to go into, what do we have to go to, actually? I'll pause for the cause one second. This is probably the longest video I've done, because uh, this is part two, uh, and, uh, part two of, uh, of two, right? In the whole video, I've gone through pretty much the whole tour portion. But anyway, chapter 24. <clears throat> Shoot. Um, this boss for the cause, man. I've been doing a lot of reading, doing a lot of talking. We give thanks and praise, get our minds right. Give thanks and praise to the Most High Yahweh. Ja! Rastafari. Aliyah Selassie. Adoniah Yeshua I. Mashiach I. Alright. Chapter 24 and verse 1. And Hashem, with the name Yahweh Jah, spoke to Moshe, saying, Command the children of Israel that they bring to you clear oil of pressed olives for the light to make the lamps burn continually. And so that lamb, that anointing oil came from the olives. Remember Yeshua or Jesus Christ, this Messiah, you know, our Lord and Savior in the first advent, you know, was in uh, the Mount of Olives you know, before he was betrayed and arrested to be crucified. Remember that, you know, that anointing oil. Uh, you have to put pressure on an olive, you know, pressure on the olives. You know, to produce that oil, for anointing oil. A lot of times we go through pressures of life to 
produce good fruits. See, it's the true body of Christ. Um, but the Lord Yahweh or Hashem spoke to Moshe saying, command the children of Israel that they bring to you clear oil of the pressed olives for the light to make the lamps burn continually. We have to keep our oil, our spiritual oils full of, you know, full within our lamps. Keep those lamps burning within the seven chakras, the seven lights through the Ruach HaKodesh, and the Holy Spirit. See? So outside the veil, verse 3, outside the veil of the witness and the tent of appointment, Aaron is to arrange it from evening until morning before Hashem continually a law forever throughout your generations. Well, our ultimate high priest, Kohan Gadol, is uh, Yeshua now, and even more so through his majesty, is the king of kings and Yeshua, both in the first and second advent as Messiah. You know, as above, so below. He is our finalized high priest that keeps, it's like Aaron or Aaron was in that time, to arrange it from evening until morning before Hashem continually. Continually, we know that our Lord and Savior, Yeshua, and even his majesty in Christ, does that for us through the Holy Spirit. In the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, in the name of the Holy Spirit. All right. So verse 5. And you shall take fine flour and bake 12 cakes with it, two tenths of an ephah in each cake. A divine number of 12. The 12 tribes of Israel. The 12 disciples of Messiah, right? And you shall set them in two rows, six in a row on the clean table before Hashem. And you shall put clear frankincense on each row. And it shall be on the bread as remembrance, portion, and offering made by fire to Hashem. The Hebrew tradition, priesthood, we know that uh, Messiah in the first advent through baby Yeshua, Jesus Christ, that first sighting or epiphany of the Christ child, the, the, the wise men brought the incense frankincense and myrrh, you know, to the, to the child. So, verse 8, on every Sabbath, he is to arrange it before Hashem continually from the children of Israel, an everlasting covenant. That's why we should keep the Sabbath, the true seven-day Sabbath, even more so in Christ, as far as the main ten commandments, especially. And it shall be for Adon and his sons, and they shall eat it in the set-apart places, because it is most set-apart to him from the offerings of Hashem, made by fire, a spiritual fire, an everlasting law. Back then it was literal and spiritual, of course. And today sometimes it can be literal if it's, you know, it works out a certain way, but we know that spiritual fire through that woman of his Kadus, the Holy Spirit, that true Ruach HaKodesh is what, you know, provides that atonement for us through Jah love and salvation, especially through Christ. So, it is a made by fire, an everlasting law, it shall be for Adon and his sons. They shall eat of it. We are, you know, Selassie's sons, you know, through the King of Kings and Christ, Justice Yeshua. And these were New Covenant times. Verse 10, And the son of an Israelite woman, whose father was a Mitzrian man or Egyptian man, went out amongst the children of Israel. And the Israelite woman, or the Israelite woman's son, and a man of Israel, strove in the camp. Verse 11, And the Israelite woman, or the Israelite woman's son, blasphemed the name and curse. So they brought him to Moshe, the great prophet uh, Moses, or Musa. Now his mother's name was Shelomit, the daughter of, of Debri. She pronounced uh, Debri of the tribe of Dan. And they put him under guard that it might be declared to them at the month of Hashem. Or the, excuse me, they put him under guard that it might be declared to them at the mouth of of Hashem, the mouth of the Lord, Yahweh, Jehovah. Verse 13, And Hashem spoke to Moshe, saying, Bring the one who has cursed outside the camp, and all those who had heard him shall lay their hands on his head, and all the congregation shall stone him. Wow. Verse 15, And speak to the children of Israel, saying, Anyone who curses his Elohim shall bear his sin. That's blasphemy. Why would you blaspheme? That's, that's another clear evidence that we can't get too caught up in tribalism, especially in renewed covenant times, even more so in renewed covenant times through Messiah, through Christ. Think about it. Too caught up on lineage and so-called skin color or race or, or gender or whatever it is. Come on, man. This, you know, Israelite woman's son blasphemed the name because why? Because you had an Israelite woman whose father was an Egyptian man. The sojourners were 
spiritual Israelites grafted in. You know? So that's blasphemy. And yes, that was old covenant times. Yes, I yes, I do I, I do still agree with a lot of modern day Christians, even outside of fellow true Orthodox Christians or pre Constantine Christians that and other Israelites. I do agree with a lot of modern day Christians, despite the lures of counterfeit Christianity and dispensationalism, come back to full circle when it comes to the basic good news gospel of Jah love. Yes, those were old covenant times that we're not under the law now, but we're still under the law of Hashem through Christ, regardless of where we live or dwell on the face of the earth, but we're not under the, the, the temple. Is, there's not a, there's not a temple in your local hometown or, or backyard in the country or, you know, we, and, you know, they're still building a so-called temple or claim to be building a so-called temple in the modern Israeli Jewish state of Israel. But that's all. And, and eventually they probably will try to do something, but that's all just smoke and mirrors, man. Think about it. Man. This is, uh, yeah, there will be a temple rebuilt, but the metaphysical temple really is the body of Messiah, the people in connection with true ethnic and spiritual Israel, which is the true body of Christ. Those who keep the commandments of Elohim and hold the true testimony of of Jesus Christ or Yeshua the Messiah, even through the even through His Majesty as the King of Kings and Yeshua Messiah, within the first and second advent, the fulfillment of prophecy. So, you know, he who blossoms the name of Hashem shall certainly be put to death. That's serious business. Read that again. He who blossoms the name of Hashem, the Shem of the name Yahweh, shall certainly be put to death, and all the congregation. Certainly stone him, the stranger, as well as the native. When he blossoms the name, he is put to death. Verse 17. And a man who strikes the being of any man shall certainly be put to death. Out of wickedness or being violent or trying to murder somebody or injure somebody. That's wicked. <clears throat> and he, he who strikes a beast repays it body for body. That's compensation. And that's just, right? Tell me if it's not. A lot of that even goes parallel to man's law, even in this whole wicked Babylon system. But we're not going to get into that right now. But that's good. Some of these, some of man's law has to go parallel with morality when it comes to righteousness, because this is, this is Yah's law or Hashem's law. He who strikes a beast repays it, body for body. Verse nineteen. And when a man inflicts a blemish upon his neighbor, as he has done so, it is done to him. Fracture for fracture, <clears throat> eye for eye, tooth for tooth. As he inflicts a blemish upon him, so it is done to him. Verse 21. And he who strikes a beast repays it. And he who strikes a man to death is put to death. Of course, that's if it's unjust, it's murder. It's one of the main ten commandments we're not supposed to break but keep. Along with uh, idolatry. We're not supposed to commit idolatry and, and, and um, adultery. We're not supposed to break any of the ten commandments. You see, the, the so-called ten commandments are the, the ten words. The Asadat the Barim. So you break one word or one commandment, you break all ten commandments, right? But especially there are different commandments amongst the ten words that are more severe. Common sense. The pseudo dispensationalism. Oh well, you know, and I did say pseudo dispensationalism before I <clears throat> before I interrupted myself, but people will say, Oh well, sin is sin before the eyes of the Lord. Well, that's true on, on a certain scale, but come on. Our Heavenly Father knows there's, there's a big difference in accidentally stepping on a snail on your back porch versus you premeditated murder, which is pure evil. If it's unjust. Now, I'm not talking about self-defense or a justified war and battle, physical battle. I'm not talking about that. Come on now. And then all these uh, pseudo-ism and schisms <clears throat> and much love to the great Gandhi and other great types of enlighteners and wise men and gurus, you know, but like the eye for an eye, everyone goes blind. That's, that's, that's in a worldly sense. That, that, that's, 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 that's in a worldly sense. This is just according to the, the true laws of karma judgment to keep us balanced, to keep us faithful. And if we love and keep Jah's commandments or love and keep Hashem's commandments to the best of our ability in this present life on earth, then we do have peace and harmony and love and everything we strive for. So keep that in mind. So Fracture for fracture, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, as he inflicts a blemish upon him, so it is done to him. <clears throat> and of course, Yeshua says, or Jesus Christ says, you know, turn the cheek. Well, you only have two cheeks. He also says in his teachings, do not resist an evildoer. Go look it up. So we're going to put these things in content. And he who strikes a beast repays it. 
He who strikes a man to death is put to death. You are to have one right ruling for the stranger and for the native. For I am Hashem, your Elohim. I am the Lord Yahweh, your Elohim. And Moshe spoke to the children of Israel. And they brought the one who cursed outside the camp and stoned him with stones. And the children of Israel did as Hashem commanded Moshe. No, no tribalism amongst our people. They're caught up in the flesh and caught up in these little fleshy things that cause division, such as skin tone or ethnicity or lineage. Right? Now, unless we're talking about the priesthood in Old Covenant times, it's different. So, you know, I read <clears throat> recently, uh, or actually several years back, I read the Tao of the Wu, written by the Rizzo from Wu Tang, or the infamous Wu Tang clan. And he had this philosophy of two cheeks, <clears throat> like Christ talked about, turn the cheek. But you only have two cheeks because Christ Jesus or Yeshua, as Messiah in the first advent, he says, you know, do not resist an evildoer. If somebody's coming at you with, you know, you know, dukes, they're coming at they're coming at you with their dukes up or fist and boots, or they got a knife or a sword or a gun. Of course, you know, I wouldn't fight back with my bare hands if the person has a gun. I would probably run. But if you know if somebody's shooting at you and you have you have a gun or you have some way to protect yourself, or even with you know fist and boots, you have to do not resist an evil doer. <clears throat> but if someone strikes you in the cheek, whether physically, like supposed to be your brother, your, your fellow Israelite brother, your fellow true brother in Christ, your fellow Torah observant true brother in, in Messiah, literally or even verbally, someone strikes you. Verbally as an insult or disrespects you. you know, we we turn the cheek, show mercy, and grace, and forgiveness. You know, but after we we turn both cheeks a couple times, and you know, you put your foot down with people. <clears throat> we go back to eye for an eye. It's, it's just that will make the whole world see and not be blind. We can seek Jah Kingdom, truly seek Jah Kingdom through through peace and love and, and, and harmony. That we will have on this earth one day. We strive for that now. You know, I and I strive for that now through Jack Kingdom. All right, so I hope <clears throat> that has uh, brought some kind of insight to those who are just now seeking uh, these uh, Torah portion readings. I love you. Job bless. Till next time. Shalom.